Welcome to the Kentucky History Channel, where we strive to bring you all the Kentucky history content you want and you deserve. Kentucky is a part of all of us, and we plan on covering all the history we can, from Pike County to Fulton County, from Louisville to Harlan. Here on our YouTube channel, you can find many videos dedicated to different events, people, governors, and places in Kentucky. There's something for everybody. While you're here, if you like the channel, hit the subscribe button and the notification button so you get notified anytime new Kentucky history is available. And if you want to support the channel, we have a Patreon page as well, or patreon.com slash kyhistorypod. Welcome back to the Kentucky History Podcast. I'm your host, Jameson Cable, and we're here to bring you some more good Kentucky history. And I got a very special guest with me, McCade Greer Professor at Penn State University. I'm pleased to have with us Dr. Christina Snyder, author of the award-winning book, Great Crossings, Indian Settlers and Slaves in the Age of Jackson. Dr. Snyder, how are you doing? Oh, I'm great. Thank you for having me. Well, uh, thank you for coming on again. Um, you know, it, another one of these things, the listeners are probably used to it. Um, a book falls in my hands or a topic falls in my hands and then uh, it, it, we go down the rabbit hole and we got to get somebody on to talk about it. And um, I just got to say, I really enjoyed your book. Um, living here in Kentucky. I had no idea about the Choctaw Academy um, and, and the kind of the interworkings of this time period as much. Um, very familiar with Richard Minton Johnson, but not as, not as much as I am now. Uh, <laughs> uh, a very interesting topic. Um, before we go, though, or before we get started, um, tell us a little bit about yourself, um, you know, you're a hist hist history professor at Penn State, but just some more stuff, you know, Kentucky Connection and so forth. Sure, yeah. I, I was actually born in Louisville, Kentucky. Um, I only lived there till I was about six years old, and I, so I grew up mostly in Georgia, um, but most of my family's from Kentucky, and one of the things that was really fun about this book project is that I I uh, got to go back to Kentucky and do a lot of research there. So um, the Filson Historical Society in Louisville uh, is one of the most important uh, manuscript collections uh, for early Kentucky history in general, uh, and certainly for this book project. And I did a little bit of research too in uh, Frankfurt um, uh, and uh, in Lexington at the University of Kentucky. So enjoyed my time there. Um, and this was a really archivally rich story. I mean, there are so many more sources than I thought that there would be. So that was one of the fun things about researching the book. Uh, well, I was going to say there's about uh, probably about 50 some pages in the back about resources. <laughs> I think uh, quite a bit. <sighs> Yeah, yeah, there's definitely, it's very, I try to be very detailed with the notes. Um, and, you know, some of these things are only available by going to archives, but some of them are available online or in print. And yeah, I encourage people to go and, and check out the notes if they want to learn more. Uh, yeah, um, and, you know, I got to say, and that, that's true with a lot of uh, resources. I don't know, I, I use the Library of Congress a lot. And I try to look at, you know, find pictures and so forth, but it always, it always gets me when it says you have to, you have to get this resource in person. I'm like, ah, <laughs> put it on the list. <laughs> uh, I can't make too many trips to, you know, DC, uh, <laughs> you know, without planning. It's true. It's expensive. It's time consuming. I think it's really like, it, it's a privilege to be able to do this kind of work and be able to travel around. And I really like that looking at old documents, you know, and sitting uh, in the archives. So it is it is kind of a treat. Um, and I think in this age of digitization that we think that, oh, everything's available online, but really like digitizing materials is really expensive for archives yep. and they often don't have very many resources. So they're, like you said, Jameson, there's just a lot of material that's only available if you actually go to the archive. Yeah, yeah, and uh, you know, I'm, I'm a sucker for maps. I like looking at the old maps. Mm. Those, are, those are cool. Um, well, a little bit about about the book and, and just just some praise for it. Like, well, oftentimes, um, 
you know, you, you get a book and uh, especially a history book um, and, you know, you kind of read through it and, and it's, there's a lot of information coming at you and so forth. Um, but when I'm, when I'm reading a different type of book, like a, a fiction book or something like that, you know, you don't know what's going to happen. You know, you're kind of on the edge of your seat and so forth. I was on the edge of my seat with this book too. <laughs> and I knew what was going to happen. I know, I know, how, I know how it ends, but like I'm sitting here pulling for, you know, pulling for the, the Choctaw, a nation um, and, and some of the I, I, I'm I probably mispronounced some of the words but as uh, Peter Pitchlin oh yeah that's yeah. right mm -hmm. yeah. yeah and I'm, I'm, I'm pulling for him but like even though I know I, I know how it's going to end and, it, and it's a bit um, it can be a little depressing <laughs> it's it, yeah it's a tough story and I think that's the thing about um, you know American history is that it is full of really difficult stories that are still very important to understand, you know? Um, and one of the reasons I was interested in doing this project is, um, I think, you know, one of the things you're alluding to is the fact that uh, Andrew Jackson's Indian removal policy is a big part of the book. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, almost all the students who attended Choctaw Academy, their families were forced to remove uh, on the Trail of Tears. And um, the Choctaws were among those. Um, and yeah, I think we have to reckon with the, um, you know, appalling scale of that, you know, and, and how much it transformed um, the continent. Um, and also still reckon with the fact that these tribes are still here and that their story doesn't end with the Trail of Tears. Yeah. And so, just to get people up to speed, um, the Choctaw, Choctaw Academy um, is still actually standing, and there is a, um, a movement to kind of get it restored, which I, I think would be great, of course, um, and hopefully we can get one, some of the people who are involved in that on the podcast as well, um, but tell us a little bit, little bit about just the Choctaw Academy, how um, it got started, and, and just the dynamics of it, because I'm very positive not a lot of people, even in Kentucky, are aware of it. Sure, I'm happy to talk about that. Um, there is still one building from the academy still standing, and it's uh, on property that's owned by Dr. Chip Richardson. And if people are interested in learning more, there's a Facebook page called Save the Choctaw Academy, mm -hmm. and uh, so he's you know working with partners, um, including the Choctaw Nation, to try to figure out a um, way to preserve it. And I, yeah, I think it has incredible potential as, a, as an interpretive site. Um, but to get back to the actual history of the Choctaw Academy, uh, this was um, the first federal um, Indian school. So the first school created for Native Americans that was technically um, owned by the War Department uh, in the federal government. And at the time, that was the department that dealt with American Indian Affairs. And the interesting thing is like at the time it was the only other school besides West Point that was controlled by the federal government. So at the time it was a very famous school and it was seen as an experiment um, because the United States at that time was pursuing what it called the civilization policy. Uh, this idea that it wanted to remake Native Americans in the image of whites. Um, and schools were one of the ways that the federal government thought of uh, as, as achieving that end. But there was really very little money that, that was put into this federal policy. The United States at that time was still pretty small and weak and didn't have a lot of money. Um, it had a very limited reach. Um, and so in reality, most of um, what happened under that policy were that missionaries carried out you know, some of these uh, policies of the federal government. So most of the Western um, style schooling that was available to Native Americans at the time was through mission schools. And Choctaw Academy was the only one that was not controlled by a, a missionary society. Um, so that's why it was different, special. It was supposed to be more secular. So the students had a choice as to whether or not they wanted to go to church. Mm -hmm. And they could even choose different. I mean, some of the students um, were already Christian or were interested in Christianity. Um, so they actually went to all kinds of different churches in Scott County. They went to Catholic churches, Baptist, uh, Methodist. 
Um, so pretty interesting um, diversity. Um, but in any event, uh, you know, I can talk about some of the reasons why, but Native Americans, they didn't have the same view of um, the government policy as federal officials. Some Native nations were very interested in education um, and the Choctaw Nation chose to partner with the federal government to create Choctaw Academy and that's why it bears their name. Um, but eventually it became home to um, almost uh, 700 boys and men from 17 different tribal nations, not all at the same time. Um, at, at its height, I think there were about a, a, a little bit less than 150 students in residence, but it was a very big school and it was a very um, diverse school in terms of the tribes involved there. Um, and, um, you know, we can talk more about like why, I think the lesser known, the, the more well-known story is probably the federal government's um, efforts to push American schooling onto Native peoples. I think the lesser known story is why some Native peoples mm -hmm. might have been interested in that. And um, the main reason, I think, is that they were living in this time of incredible change where um, they really had to deal with the federal government in terms of uh, treaty making, um, they had to deal with the, with U.S. citizens in terms of um, trade uh, and economics. And so um, those Native nations that were interested in Western schooling, they wanted a, an advanced kind of schooling that would enable their children to like read the kind of legalese that is embedded in treaties, you know, to be able to mm -hmm. read and write um, English as well as white Americans could. Um, and they felt, you know, that that would give them a leg up in this uh, environment in which the United States was very aggressive about taking native land and resources. Mm -hmm. um, well, the one thing I, I found quite interesting was the thought that, and I can't remember which, um, who's, who, which, which of the Choctaw uh, members was uh, kind of thinking this, um, but they were thinking that you know, by educating the kids, that would lead them to possibly even getting to a statehood part, or or you know, have the the Choctaw Nation become an, a a state, and that would give them the footing they needed to, um, you know, pursue other matters and so forth. But um, and I think that was before removal, though. I think when that was kind of their their hope or their their thought. Um, and, and you know, oftentimes you sit back and look and think how 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 could have it all worked out. And you know, you know, barring the cultural class, barring the uh, other, you know, hundreds of factors. But you know, that that's one I hadn't really ever, you know, thought of. Is that you know that might have been a a, a peaceful or a better way. Um, uh, but you know, obviously that didn't happen. But you know, uh, that 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 might have been a more progressive way of handling the whole situation. Um, yeah, and I think that's something that's important to recover about people's perspectives at the time, because in history, nothing is inevitable. You know, we never know mm -hmm. what's going to happen from <laughs> one moment to the next. Like, if we just think about in our own lifetimes, COVID, like how shocking that was and how much it changed our lives, you know, like we, um, you know, we, we humans are very bad at predicting the future and we really... Uh, and, and much of it is beyond our control as individuals. Mm -hmm. So anyway, I think recovering that sense of contingency and um, people, Native people were, the, the school I should say was founded in, in uh, 1825 and it um, kept in operation until 1848. And uh, that was the time when Native peoples in the Eastern part of North America were really facing a ton of pressure um, to, to remove, to change their lifestyles. Um, and so they're trying to think of creative solutions to live peacefully. And I think that's one thing that strikes me about the, the historical record in this period is like how hard um, native leaders and everyday native people tried to fight to find peaceful solutions, things like dual citizenship. Um, something that's interesting that is um, that happened at the time is, you know, some Choctaws did talk about creating a Choctaw um, state that would eventually be incorporated into the Union. Um, 
and uh, something that um, happened among a, a few tribes, um, most prominently the Cherokees, is that they inserted um, a uh, article into their removal treaty that they wanted a representative um, in Congress. So they wanted a congressional delegate. And treaty negotiators, the Choctaws tried to do the same thing and the treaty negotiators struck it out. Or I should, maybe Senate, the Senate didn't ratify it. Um, but it, in any case, that article didn't get ratified for the Choctaw Treaty, but it did get ratified for the Cherokee Treaty. And that has never been fulfilled until, I, but now Cherokee Nation is pushing to get that delegate seated because you know it mm. is their their right under this treaty and i and i think that's a product of this period too when native people mm -hmm. are trying to think well um the power of the us is incredible we need to figure out how we can um best survive and uh you know protect our people in this really difficult circumstance mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and well i was kind of thinking like um with well, you know, I, I, you know, I, when thinking about how um, those sort of things would, would, would work out, and it, it's it's interesting to you know say that how um, during that time period, that was when the study came out, and uh, I can't remember the doctor's name who put it out, but you know that that you know you had the whites and, and other races were, were different, you know, and that was kind of very much used to kind of push the agenda of um jackson and and others and others in power uh because like and then it was it's kind of one of those typical you kind of get frustrated with the federal government thing where like jackson's like well you know this is the rule of congress or the nation but i can't control mississippi and then so mississippi it, you know ch changes their their uh rules and, and then that kind of makes it hard on the Choctaws and kind of really just that force that squeeze of you have no other option and you know when we talked about this a little earlier uh, while i was reading the uh, the chapter pretty much focused on the uh um the trail of tears you're just like gosh this is just you, you know what's gonna happen you know what's happening you know how it's going and it, it's just it's a bit it's tough to read but you know um uh something that we definitely need to be aware of and and kind of those struggles um so whenever you're like um I know in the book it talks about this a lot, but what were these um, chiefs? How did they? Who was selected to go to these um, to Choctaw Academy? Because um, there, there was other schools, missionaries, and so forth. But you know, Choctaw Academy was its own, like like we kind of said, prestigious. It was one of the one of the tops, I guess, to say it that way. Yeah. So how were the students selected? They um, initially they were almost all the. Um, the sons or nephews of high ranking political officials or of traders, um, you know, people involved in the fur trade or other kinds of economic ventures. So they're pretty um, in their own communities, high ranking uh, children. And I should say they're all boys and men. And there was some discussion as to whether women and girls should go to this school too, which is interesting. Um, and Richard Mentor Johnson actually pushed this, or he at least tested the waters, but Native nations weren't interested at that time. And I think there are a couple of reasons, like there was a fear of sexual abuse, which had happened sometimes in the missionary school. Um, and, you know, a concern about like having a lack of control over the environment that would be like very far away from their tribal communities. Um, and I think the other thing is that it was really boys and men who they expected to take on these roles vis-a-vis um, -vis the United States that mm -hmm. the Choctaw Academy would train them for, things like becoming lawyers or um, traders themselves or businessmen, you know? So um, mm -hmm. it's really these more public facing jobs which are thought of as, as being more masculine at the time. So, um, yeah, the, the the boys initially who go, they do range in age a lot and that would kind of shock us today. Um, I mean, at the time there was no standardized primary and secondary education like there is today. And academies like Choctaw Academy um, were really split into skill level. So they included everybody from like 
people who are learning their basic reading, writing, and arithmetic, all the way up to people who are studying Greek and Latin and moral philosophy. Mm -hmm. um, and, and so they're at Choctaw Academy, they were children as young as six years old, and then men who were in their early 20s. Um, so like a really huge age range. Um, there was a shift over time in terms of who went there. I mean, the Choctaw Academy definitely became less prestigious over time. Native peoples became really, um, felt that the quality of instruction had gone down over time. And it's definitely true that Richard Mentor Johnson siphoned money off the academy like the whole time. And this is very clearly documented in his papers. So there's, you know, absolutely no question about this. Um, well, you, you mean you mean a politician might have been taking a little off for them? <laughs> yes, yeah, shocking, Whoa. I know. <laughs> shocking. Yeah. And this is something that Richard Mentor Johnson was, he had a lot of critics in Kentucky for um, related to the academy, but also other kinds of federal contracts that he had he and his brothers had gotten, you know, that that was one of the main sources of criticism. So yeah, the a corrupt politician who who could have ever guessed. Um, <laughs> But yeah, as, as the quality of instruction went down, the elite people, um, I mean, some um, continue to send their children, but uh, there's, um, I would say like over time, uh, you start to get um, more like middling families or even some orphans, um, people who probably lost um, their families during the Trail of Tears or some of the, um, famine and, and sickness that that followed thereafter um so yeah it's it's very broad um mm. and in terms of the tribes represented they're incredibly diverse i mean they speak um at least 16 different languages oh. and some of them are very like not related to one another at all like some of them were as different from one another as french is from chinese mm -hmm. so these are not like close, like some of the languages are closely related, but most of them are not. Mm -hmm. um, and so they themselves are meeting native people from all across the continent who have like very different economies and lifestyles. Um, and that seems to be one of the things that really interested the students um, about, about going to school there. Um, and well, one thing I, when I was, whenever I was reading, uh, I, I, I thought it was very interesting whenever some of the boys had to do farm work and how yes, much sir. they disdained farm work, which, you know, to <laughs> us, that probably says, well, well, you know, it's a typical, you know, male role, but the gender roles, gender roles and natives and so forth was a lot uh, different. You know, the, the females all often did the farming in the trial in the uh, villages and all that. Um, but, you know, the, it's so, so complex. Like you're saying, there was 16, some different languages. This was a full, this was like a complete a foreign boarding school like you know people mm -hmm. from you know just if you threw you know Chinese uh, uh Spanish or you know people from Italy and France and you know just America and you put them all in a school speaking different languages it would it would be um quite the diverse population so even though they were all say native tribes and and all that they weren't the same um uh, you know, they weren't from this, they didn't have the same backgrounds and so forth, um, which would, of course, cause a few problems at the academy. Uh, but I found it more interesting how um, some of the, um, some of the boys kind of felt um, superior at times to say some of the, the, the slaves that were working there. And then even, even other, there was all this, you know, just the cultural, cultural clash going on in this one place. So it, it was quite interesting in itself. Yeah, yeah. I mean, there's, um, there, are, you know, it's a complicated place. I think <laughs> the reason that it interested me so much is that it really is like a crossroads of America in that period. I mean, there are mm -hmm. um, people from many different backgrounds there. Um, the native uh, men and boys that we've talked about, also um, Johnson um, and his extended family, and local whites who these mm -hmm. native students went to church with and sometimes went to their houses and things like that. Um, so they knew some of these community people. And then the other component are um, free and enslaved African Americans who are there. So Johnson uh, located the school on his plantation, which was a working plantation at the time. Um, he had 
sometimes 50 enslaved people or more working there. Um, and they are the ones who do much of the day-to-day -day operational things at the school, like cooking and cleaning. Um, and this leads to a pretty wide range of um, engagement with the students. So, mm -hmm. you know, we talk about cultural diversity. Um, one issue that divided students was the issue of slavery and of African-American slavery. Um, some of the boys um, from the South actually came from slaveholding families. Um, mm -hmm. So this was a practice that some elite native families um, engaged in. Some of them had actually grown up on plantations um, and they uh, had a kind of anxiety about being lumped in with African-Americans as one people of color. And they really wanted to distinguish themselves as um, not black and as elite uh, people in that era who had a lot of resources. And um, they would also say that they had a lot of refinement. I mean, they thought of themselves as gentlemen. And of course, whites uh, didn't necessarily see it that way. You know, some whites mm -hmm. definitely um, thought of, um, well, really believed in white supremacy and the idea that native people could never have the kind of intellectual achievements or, um, economic potential or political potential as whites. So there is this really kind of fraught environment. Um, at the same time, I mean, it is interesting because some of these native students from different tribal nations, one of the things that we know they did was um, they did intertribal dances. So they taught each other their different dancing mm -hmm. um, styles and expressions and also sports. So, um, yeah, we, we know that there's some cultural exchange. And, you know, some of these Native students came from tribes that really uh, had not engaged in Black uh, enslavement and, in fact, fought against it at the school. So there are some fights where students try to intervene um, when overseers try to beat uh, enslaved women. Um, and then there's also a really interesting episode where um, one of the Native teachers and one of the Native students run away with two enslaved women, and they're trying to go north, you know, maybe to Canada, but, um, you know, possibly to Anishinaabeg, um, so to Indigenous territory. Um, so, yeah, there's like a, a range of relationships, and I think it really reflects the diversity of opinions about race and place in antebellum America. Mm -hmm. And... and you know, I'm glad you. I'm glad you. You said said the term because I was going to bring that up about the where they were headed. But I was like, I don't know if I can pronounce this pronounce this right. <laughs> but uh, that's another like just the dynamics going on in in this in in that one place. And um, you know, you talk about you know ant antebellum America, and like a lot of times when people think about Kentucky history, you think about you know frontier, Civil War. And that ante, antebellum time period is, you know, oftentimes just glossed over. You know, Henry Clay was there, and uh, Richard Minton Johnson was the vice president. That's kind of the that's kind of the gist of it. But um, even in this one, you know, Great Crossing, so much, so much going on there that reflects the entire nation. You know, it's not just mm -hmm. um, happening in Kentucky. This is being played out, maybe in Kentucky, but the whole nation is is, is experiencing that. Um, uh, anything else to add about the Choctaw Academy, and um, then we, we can maybe uh, talk about Richard Minton Johnson and uh, Julia Chin for a, a little bit. Um, well, since this is a Kentucky history podcast, one of the things that your listeners might be interested to know is that um, some of the graduates from Choctaw Academy went to Transylvania University, oh, yeah. and and that was actually part of the original appeal for Native families because at that time Transylvania was like the most prestigious yeah. university in the West, and it was one of the first school uh, universities in the United States to have a law school and a medical school. Mm -hmm. um, so, uh, it, I did some research at the Transy Archives, which was a really great experience. Um, and the interesting thing is, like, if you go back and look at the 19th century records of Transy, um, they did lose a lot of those records in a fire. But what remains, um, it does have students enrollment information, but it doesn't list their race or ethnicity. 
And so you would have to be looking for a specific individual yeah. to know that they were Native American. Um, and, and so it was actually a surprise to the university that they didn't know that they had any non-white students. Um, wow. Until, yeah, until the civil rights era. So this was a surprise to them. And um, some of these students, um, they, what they would actually do is kind of uh, do some college level courses at Choctaw Academy and then enter the law school or the medical school. That was what they're really interested in. So I found um, a few students who actually took that path. Um, so that was, that was really interesting um, to me. And it was also interesting to see just what those students did with their education. So, to, I mean, invariably they return to their tribal communities and practice medicine or uh, law and, you know, sometimes um, negotiated future treaties and things like that. So that's a, like a local point of information, maybe for listeners that I thought was really interesting. Yeah, um, well, and, and another thing to kind of mention as well is oftentimes, um, or pr pr primarily all the time, these students, when they came to Choctaw Academy, they, they took upon, um, I guess, you know, a, a white name or an, an English name. Uh, so that would probably have made it a little bit harder because there was a few of the, the Choctaw Academy students who, you know, were, we're going to stop right there with our discussion with the author, Christina Snyder, and we're going to pick up next week with some more discussion about her book and, and Julia Chan and Richard Minton Johnson. Thank you all for listening. And we'll see you next time. Welcome to the Kentucky History Channel, where we strive to bring you all the Kentucky history content you want and you deserve. Kentucky is a part of all of us, and we plan on covering all the history we can, from Pike County to Fulton County, from Louisville to Harlan. Here on our YouTube channel, you can find many videos dedicated to different events, people, governors, and places in Kentucky. There's something for everybody. While you're here, if you like the channel, hit the subscribe button and the notification button so you get notified anytime new Kentucky history is available. And if you want to support the channel, we have a Patreon page as well or patreon.com slash kyhistorypod. You've probably heard about Daniel Boone, but what about the rest of the frontiersmen who came to Kentucky and settled? That's what we want to bring to the Kentucky History Channel. The stories of the untold, the stories of those forgotten. One thing to expect on our channel is great Kentucky content. Some stories that you've never heard of. The Night Riders, who began in Western Kentucky. Bloody Monday, the riots in Louisville. the assassination of Governor Goebel, the only governor ever assassinated in the United States. Stories from all over Kentucky, stories that are unforgettable once you've heard them. You can find out who counties in Kentucky are named after and how your county got started. From beginning to end, we plan to document every county in Kentucky, all 120. Reach out to us on all of our social media platforms. Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. And also leave a comment on one of our YouTube videos. You can also check out our podcast episodes. You can subscribe to our podcast on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, iHeartRadio, and many more. We're always seeking to find more Kentucky history so we can bring it to you. The viewers, the listeners, we want all the stories and all the events from Kentucky's great history to be told and shared everywhere.